Good morning, and welcome to Men of the Word, a men's ministry of Calvary Chapel Heartland right here in Fort Valley, Georgia. Our church is about three miles west on Highway Georgia Highway 96, about three miles from the Interstate 75, and I am your host, Greg Cannington. Here at Calvary Chapel Heartland, we teach the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. We skip nothing because we believe, and the Word of God says very clearly, that the whole counsel of God is what the world needs to read, to hear, and understand. And that's God's Word contained in both the Old and the New Testaments. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. All of Scripture, Old and New Testament, is important. And as a result, that is our whole doctrine here at Calvary Chapel Heartland and in Calvary Chapels in general, is teaching the Bible. Therefore, Bible study is what we do here. From our Sunday morning services, which Senior Pastor Jerry Axe tells me, teaching in the Gospel of John, to this morning's, if you're watching today uh, online, we had this very self-same study in Hebrews chapter 4, chapter 5, rather, this morning at the Chick-fil-A on Watson Boulevard. Then again, there's another Bible study that's also online. will be tomorrow night, and you'll see it uh, probably on Thursday, where Pastor Phil Snyder has been teaching throughout the whole Old Testament, and we're currently in the book of 1 Samuel. But there are other ministries that we have that also teach the Bible. There's another one going on at the Calvary Cafe in just about 15 minutes. It's a ladies' study, and it's a, a study that's, we call it a home, it's, it's kind of like a home fellowship, but it's a care group is what we actually call it. Then again, tonight, there's another ladies' study. So the ladies can come in the morning to get a study or in the evening. Then again, we have our youth ministry on Friday nights with Paul and Jenner Berger. That's for the middle schoolers and high schoolers. Those, that, those three, the ladies' studies and the, the middle school and high school, is not online. But the good news is we'd love to have you here. So if you're in the area, please come by and worship with us, study with us, fellowship with us. But if you can't or you miss a, miss a one, just go back and you can go online. Go to our website, C-C-H-G-A, standing for Calvary Chapel Heartland, G-A for Georgia, dot org. And you can find all of our links to the Facebook and YouTube channels, and you can see our ministries. As a matter of fact, we all do it. When we're on vacation, we, can, we don't miss a beat. We stay in tune with God's Word. There's, one, there's another study that just kicked off recently with uh, Assistant Pastor Aaron Glaze and his wife Donna, and they're doing that on Thursday nights, and that's a uh, young adult ministry. But before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, Lord, we lift our praises and worship to you, Lord, and thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, who purchased our sins upon that cross where he died and was buried, and yet on the third day rose from the dead that first Easter Sunday, defeating death forever for all those who call him Lord and Savior. Father, we give thanks for your word, Lord, these holy scriptures that give evidence of who you are and testifies to the truth. Lord, we thank you for your infinite grace and mercy. And Lord, we thank you for your ever, never-ending, never-changing faithfulness to your promise. Lord, we lift this study up to you, Father, as we gather together to open your word, we pray the Holy Spirit will join us right here and open our hearts to the deeper understanding and meanings contained in your word, Lord. And we desire to draw closer to you, Father. 
through this word and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, our Savior. Amen. We've been in, uh, this is the fifth week that we've been in the book of Hebrews. And it's really important to always remember that this was a, while the author isn't completely known, some believe the Apostle Paul wrote it, there are some others, and it doesn't really matter who actually, who's the human that penned it, the, the words are from the Holy Spirit. But it was written primarily to a Judy, a Jewish audience, a Jewish audience of Christian believers. So that's the context. So when you, well, as we go through it, keep that in the back of your mind of the audience. And it was written to this audience. Obviously, there's great value for us, me personally being a Gentile. But just re focus, remember in the back of your mind, this is focused on the Jewish believers and some who may be on, on straddling the fence, so to speak. So we'll begin. So turn your Bibles to chapter 5 in the book of Hebrews. And we'll give a, a quick update of where we've been. In chapter 1 of Hebrews, the writer focused on Jesus' exaltation and the fact that he is the Son of God. And today, since he uh, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of, father, of the Father, and he's our advocate there in heaven. He's our lawyer. We have the accuser, the Satan accusing us, but he's our defense attorney. And he's, and he's God, the Son of God. So think about that. Guess who wins? Well, we know because we've read the end of the book in uh, Revelation. In chapter 2, it focused on Christ Jesus, the fact that he humbly left heaven and became and was born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit through his mother Mary, who was a descendant of King David, to fulfill the scriptures, born in Bethlehem, all prophesied. And as doing so, he humbled himself from his exalted position in heaven to live as a man, to live as a human, to be subject to the same trials, temptations, troubles, as any other living person. Yet, he was fully God, and he's fully man. And that's important because he was and is our kinsman, our kinsman redeemer. And you can find that in the book of Leviticus and also illustrated quite beautifully in the book of Ruth. The nearest relative that can redeem, purchase, pay off the debts, those kind of things. Our kinsman redeemer is Jesus, born as a man, fully God, fully man. Well, in chapter 3, shifts a bit to why Jesus is better than Moses. Now, once again, remember this is to a Jewish audience. Now, they revered Moses, and rightfully so. We all should. But Jesus is far higher. Jesus is God. He purchased us with his life and rose from the dead and all who believe in him will not die a second death, will be alive in heaven with him forever. Chapter 3 focused on, changed again, focusing on the rest that we have in God. And it's God's rest, not man's rest. And no, we don't need to seek our own rest, but seek the rest that God has promised us throughout Scripture. Jesus is superior to Moses because of that. He can, believing in Jesus can give us that, that rest in our hearts. And the Bible talks about it a lot, you know, that you know, we trust the Lord, give Him our burdens, He will bear them for us and keep us strong and and support us. He will never leave us and never forsake us. That's so important. And it talked about in chapter 3 as well, is that don't be like the Israelite generation 
that left Mount Sinai after two years heading toward the promised land. Twelve spies were sent into the land to spy it out. Ten come back with a report. Oh no, there's giants in the land. They have walled cities and they are stronger than us. But two spies, being Joshua and Caleb, said, no, let's not do this. God has been with us all along. He has promised us that he would be with us. We just have to be faithful. But they didn't listen, and that's what in chapter 3 warns again. Don't be like our people were back then, where they got another 38 years of wandering in the desert till they all died out except for two, Joshua and Caleb, because they were faithful. Now, they were 80-year-old men when they went in the promised land, but Caleb said, give me the land where the giants are. That's what I want, because I know that God's going to be with us. So that's the warning in chapter 3. Well, chapter 4 led us into more about God's promised rest, but also a key point which we will carry on through several chapters in Hebrews, the fact that Jesus is now our high priest. And this is going to be very different from anything the Jews of that day were accustomed to. So as we open our Bibles to chapter 5, we're going to read a lot more about this. It's going to need some explanation, which I hope I can provide, but it's all provided through Scripture. Not what Greg says, unless I say it, or another person's opinion. This We're going to be quoting Scriptures as well. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. So verse 1, chapter 5. For every high priest is taken from among men and is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and forgiveness of sins. Now, if you recall, if you studied Scripture, especially in Leviticus, with all these rules about sacrifice, the high priest and the priests from the Levites, they were the ones descendants of Aaron, they did the actual sacrifice, the, the killing of the sacrifice, the, whether it's a burnt offering or a peace offering, any of those things, they were responsible for that, and it was all laid out very clearly. Now, these descendants of Aaron, the brother of Moses, became the first high priest. So, now this high priest was appointed by God. God said, and we can read it in Scripture, God said, Aaron will be my high priest. Moses was essentially the prophet, the man who spoke with God and got messages from God. So it opens up with, according to the law, the law of Moses, priests must be from the tribe of Levi, descended from Aaron. And while they minister before God for the people by making these sacrifices, they, being imperfect, must also sacrifice for themselves because they're not perfect. No man, no woman is. So laying that down, we go to the next verse. says, He can, being the high priest, have compassion, which in the Greek would be also could be to deal gently with compassion, gentleness, on those who are ignorant, don't know any better, or going astray, since he himself, this high priest, is also subject to weakness. What mortal person is not? We all are. Because of this, he is required for the people and also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins first for himself and his family and then for the people. And he did this. There was one day, the Day of Atonement, also known as Yom Kippur, when the high priest... They sacrificed a bull and he took blood from the bull and they chose two goats 
by lot, one was sacrificed and blood from that sacrifice <coughs> was taken into the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. And he could only go in there once a year, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Sprinkle blood on the mercy seat. First for himself and his family, and then for the people. <clears throat> and he had to purify himself prior to going in because two of Moses' sons didn't do it right. They kindled what was no, it says in the scripture, unholy fire, and God struck them dead. How dare they not, as priests, go in and follow what God had laid out. So this was a serious business. Still is. It's a holy day in the Jewish calendar. It's the highest of holy days. Verse 4, And no man takes this honor as a high priest to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. God appointed him high priest, and that passed on through the sons of the high priest. Now over the years, and you can read this in some of the minor prophets about how corrupt it had begun, the, high, the priesthood had, be, had become. And we have examples. The, you know, go into the uh, uh, Gospels and read how the high priests were, the high priest had been relieved, taken out of control by the Roman government in Jesus' time and there was uh, a, the son of the high priest that was removed, yet the whole thing had become a political thing. Not a, not a spiritual thing, but political. And as a result, any time mankind gets involved in political appointments and stuff, what happens? False things happen. We stray from it. And we see it in modern times as well, People who, in churches that would teach scripture and stand by it, have evolved to do, well, let's do what society says so we're not criticized. No. Follow what God said. He doesn't change. Society will change several more times, maybe even in my, gener in my lifetime. Well, God, God's word, it's constant. Never forget that. That's so important. But the point here in, in verse 4 is, remember, this is an appointment by God. This is not an appointment by man. A man can't do it. I mean, he can't declare, I'm the high priest, I'm taking over. That doesn't work. So explaining this to this Jewish audience, the differences is so important. And why we need to focus on that, at least keep it in the back of your mind. Stay away because... Anything that's man-made is subject to the whims of whoever is in charge, really. Remember, Jesus called them out, and they didn't like it. That's why they hated him and wanted to kill him. We continue with verse 5, and this is, this is the key turning point in this scripture. So, also, Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that's a quote from uh, Messianic kingdom prophecy of uh, Psalm 2, verse 7. Quoted here. Of course, that is from God the Father. Verse 6 continues, and also in another place, and then we're going to take you to Psalm 110. It's, he says, Unlike the priesthood of Aaron, which ran into many roadblocks and happened on and off, the priesthood of Melchizedek lasts forever. Now, this is going to require some explanation because not everybody may realize who this is. So who is Melchizedek? 
Well, the actual scripture that's quoted here, uh, Psalm 110 said in verse 4, you are a priest forever, and this is speaking of the coming Messiah, according to the order of Melchizedek, the type. It's another way to put it. So who is this? Who was this Melchizedek? Well, if you turn to Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20, you'll read about him. And he, he's only mentioned three places in the Bible. First in Genesis, second time is in uh, Psalm 110, and the third time a couple of places here in Hebrews. The name literally means my king or my righteous or just king in, the, in the, the language, the original language. And we'll, we'll, we'll read here in a minute that he was king of Salem, which is a form of shalom or peace. So he could be a title, king of, he's the king of peace. But we will see this later in Hebrews chapter 7, that he confirms both names, the king of peace, and he's the high priest of the God Most High. And so I'm going to read from Genesis 14, 18 through 20 to give you an example of what happened. If you remember the story in Genesis, uh, a confederation of kings went in and sacked uh, Sodom, and they also sat Gomorrah and carried away people captive. And among them was Lot and his family. Lot was a nephew of Abraham. But because of that, Abraham, along with some of his neighbors, he called them the four kings, but they were townships. They gathered together and chased them down and had a fight. Well, they defeated these this confederation of five kings and got the people back along with a lot of spoil, which was common. You know, you sacked their tents and got the stuff back that they stole. So that's where this comes from. And here's what is actually said about Melchizedek. After the, the scripture says in verse 18, then, after this all occurred, Melchizedek, king of Salem, was at Jerusalem. Scholars are not sure, perhaps. Brought out bread and wine. Now think about that for a minute. Where does bread and wine enter into the life of a Christian? Obviously, it's the communion, right? And it says, he brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of of God Most High. Priest. And he is a king. That was totally different from what was the norm for the Jewish people. So this is why this is there. And then David and his messianic prophecy of the Messiah's kingdom in Psalm 2, verse 7, says, of the order of Melchizedek. So he's a type. And Melchizedek said, he blessed him, Abraham, and said, blessed be Abram, which is before it was changed to Abraham, of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, meaning Abraham, gave him a tithe of all. In other words, he gave him 10% everything that he had taken in the defeat of these kings. So Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, El Elyon in the, in the Hebrew. And scholars disagree who this guy is. Some believe he's a Christoph Christophany, a pre- uh, a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus himself. Others believe he was just a, a king and a priest of God. 
and he's so that's the mysterious. But it doesn't really matter. The point is that Abraham honored him for who he was. He was not just a king. He was a priest of the God that Abraham worshipped. And as a result, Abraham tithed a tenth of his goods to him. So as this is being explained by the writer of Hebrews to this Jewish audience, the relationship, the comparison that Jesus is the high priest standing at the right hand of God the Father right now. He is God, first he has to be, and he has to be man to be a priest. He's both. So this would go very much contrary to what the Jewish people were used to. A king and a priest, those are two separate things. It's been tried a couple of times. A good example was the first king of Israel, Saul. He did a sacrifice rather than himself before he went into battle because he was impatient for Samuel to come there. How did that work out? didn't work out very good. God was very angry about that. So was Sam. In verse 7, now we're talking again about Jesus. And you'll see this comparison to Melchizedek in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a type, future of a future king and priest. Verse 7, who in the days of his flesh while Jesus was on earth, he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, meaning the Father, who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now there's a real good... Uh, quote I read by David Guzik of the, who's online in the Enduring Word. He says this, the agony of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when you can find in Matthew 26 and Luke 22, proved he struggled with the difficulty of obedience. He knew what was going to happen. A horrible death as a crucified person, being separated from God for those days he was in the tomb which had never happened in all eternity. Yet, he obeyed perfectly, as David Grozik says, which he did. Remember, if you go back, Jesus prayed to the Father, Lord, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. In other words, is there another way, Lord? Father, is there another way? Yet, not my will, but your will. Jesus was obedient until death. Verse 9 continues, says, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And don't miss that part. Eternal salvation. Once you are truly saved, you're saved. Can't be taken away from. Jesus himself said, Who God has placed in my hand, no one can take him out of by him because it's God's hand. God has given me them to me and no one can take them away. For no one's stronger than the Father. And that, of course, is paraphrasing. He's perfected. And he's appointed by God as the author of our salvation. That's been the purpose from the beginning. And we can find it through all the prophecies that relate to the coming Messiah, both the conquering king that's coming and this and the servant. And if you don't go back and look at, and it's worth looking and reading through chapter 53 of Isaiah. Look at the prophecies that King David, not only was he king, he was a prophet. He was a man after God's own heart, and he prophesied. 
Zechariah, Micah, it's all, all prophesied. And Jesus fulfilled these to the T. Born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, which was a people would say, well, he's from Nazareth. Yeah, but he wasn't born there. Verse 10, continuing in this thought, called by God himself, the Father, as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, just like David prophesied in Psalm 2, just like in the order, that's the type, of whom we've had much to say and yet it's hard to explain, Scripture says, since you are full of dull healing, hearing. Now, that sounds kind of strong. You're trying to convince somebody or something. But it would be very difficult to explain this in just a few words. So what happens is we get in the next two chapters, and particularly in chapter 7, there's going to be a lot more talk about explaining of how this works to this audience of Jew, Jewish believers. The, Judy, the Jewish audience would certainly be familiar with Melchizedek, but it would have been a leap that he was a savior, was also their priest, high priest. It might have been difficult. John MacArthur, in his commentary, says they were spiritually lethargic to hearing any further. Could be... I can even imagine somebody saying, well, that's too deep for me to understand. Well, in reality, if you break it down with the help of the Holy Spirit, it's not that far a leap. Don't get so used to following a certain way, and this was certainly true in those their, their day, of just doing what they've always done. But now Scripture has been fulfilled. You have a new Say, you have a new covenant bought by blood, which was a requirement by Jesus, his own blood and his sacrifice on that cross. Then rising from the dead, it all became new. This is this perfection that's talked about earlier in, the, in this passage. And that's what's leading to this last part of this chapter, talking about spiritual immaturity. Verse 12 continues, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, or in other words, the scriptures. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. So that's tr trying a, mental, a uh, comparison. You're like a baby, crying milk, and you should be eating solid food. And the point is, they're being chastised. This Hebrew Jewish audience is being chastised by the writer here saying, if you're not spiritually mature by now in Christian doctrine, to, we have to be you have to be fed milk like babies because you're spiritual infants and you haven't been growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Because if you look at the scriptures, and I'm talking about not just the New Testament, but in the Old Testament and the things that were promised and the examples given of what was going to happen, it's all there. It's all there. And this thought continues in verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, meaning the scriptures, for he's a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. In other words, you've grown up spiritually because of your study of the word, because of your prayers as you're earnestly seeking God's, the Holy Spirit to guide you, which is why we always pray for the Holy Spirit to join us. 
and you're a full age, those who by reason of use of the senses exercised. That's active. You're actively exercising what you have known and you're growing to discern the differences between good and evil. And these who were become babes re- reveal themselves because they have they're unskilled in the word. They should be. If you've been saved for any period of time, you should have been growing all along. And that is why it's so important of discipleship. Discipleship of the new believer. Helping them to grow. Guiding them. That's our responsibility. That's why we teach the word. That's why it's so important to have the Holy Spirit open it up to you. You know, I can recall many times that I've read scriptures, dozens or hundreds of times, and sometimes the Spirit will show me something that I should have seen, but my heart wasn't ready. So you have to trust Him to do that for you. David Guzik wrote about this as, those who become babes reveal themselves that they are unskilled. We don't expect brand new Christians to be skilled in the word of righteousness, but those who have been Christians for a time should be. Absolutely, I agree with that 100%. Which is why we do these. Why we have Bible studies. Why Bible studies in smaller groups, Bible studies on Sunday morning, they're all key to your growth. So you too can consume the spiritual food, not just the milk of babes. My friends, I hope that and pray that by reading God's Word, has quickened your heart and given you a desire to draw draw near to God and a desire to dive in deeply into His Word. I hope and pray that each one of you has already accepted Jesus as your Savior. If you haven't, don't wait. You don't know how long you have. None of us do. Jesus is calling you. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to Jesus and is pointing to Him. And all you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus paid that price on the cross for your sin debt and believe that He is who He says He is. That He died, was buried, and rose from the grave, defeating death forever. And you too, will be saved. It's that simple. And I, if you want a little more guidance, go to Romans chapter 10, 9 through 13. We'll explain it in detail. And we're, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and one believes unto righteousness in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. Eternal salvation only through Jesus. There is not multiple ways to heaven. Jesus said it himself, and the scriptures prove it. And if that's you and you become a new believer, find yourself a Bible teaching, Bible believing church, so you can grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want to give a thanks and a shout out to my brother Kyle behind the camera who records, edits, and puts our video ministries online where you can reach it through our website or go to Facebook and type in Calvary Chapel Heartland or YouTube. Going through our website is probably the easiest. cchga.org. Join us next week when we continue our study in the book of Hebrews with chapter 6. So until then, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Amen.